Hi, uh, my name is Robin. I work at New Store, and today I will be talking about Jest and Cora. Uh, before I start, I'd like to see some hands. Uh, so, who does know uh, Jest? Cool, cool, great. And who knows Cora? Okay, cool, great. Yeah, nice. I will, I will introduce both of them. I love Jest, and I use Jest every day. With Koa, it's my hobby, and I play with that. When I was looking how to introduce the new things in Jest, I like because there were several new utilities added to Jest in the past few months, and the development is still going. And I think it's really great. People don't read the release notes, why would they, right? Uh, I found Koa uh, to be a great example to show some of these features. So please take this as a also as a showcase of possibilities of Jest. I will probably will not be able to cover all the features. Maybe you will see something and it will make you Google that. If you if you will still not understand it, please approach me and we can talk about that. First thing, uh, what is Koa? Uh, Koa is a Node.js server. What is interesting? I mean, they, they call themselves next generation. Why do that? Because it's written by the same team as Express. I mean, Express is much, much more well known. And they claim this to be a spiritual successor. Uh, Core is much, much lightweight, much more lightweight. It is also middleware based, but there is no middleware bundled, not even router, nothing else. It's just kind of, I mean, the main core repository could be a few hundred lines, not much more. Uh, what is, what's been the selling points at the beginning is that it takes care about the flow control. Uh, in the first version, they were using generators, but since uh, async await has become available in Node uh, production, they are using, in the, from the version 2, they are using async await for the uh, control. If you've ever written anything in Express, you know how the callbacks can grow. That doesn't happen in, in, in Koa, and it looks much better. I will show it later. This is the website where you can find more. What is Jest? Uh, Jest is a testing framework from Facebook. Uh, I'm personally using it for testing React application, and it's been great for that. But it's a multi-purpose uh, unit testing framework. Uh, they call it it's a delightful. Uh, and it is. Zero configuration is one of the first frameworks that does that. You just drop it into the project, you run it. It has some great defaults and it works. It's fast. It's great watch mode. Uh, and yeah, sorry. It's based on, on Jest. Uh, sorry, on, on Jasmine, of course. It's based on Jasmine. It has the very similar syntax. If you've ever seen uh, Jasmine, you will understand Jest. It uses. Uh, uh, expect for the assertion as the assertion uh, framework. Uh, even the expect library was donated to the chest later, so we kind of own it now. And it bring oh, it brought some things to the JavaScript testing, uh, like first class smoking, snapshots, and async testing. I want to talk today a lot about async testing because it can get tricky. I had a presentation about that thing uh, specifically, and. Testing async has these pitfalls. And sometimes you can write tests that always pass, which is not why you write them. And that's especially true when you are trying to catch tests that should uh, throw an error. My presentation is divided into two uh, parts. In the first part, we will be testing a middleware one single piece of Koa middleware, asynchronous middleware, obviously. In the second part, we will talk about API testing, how to test the application, let's say, from the outside. Okay, let's start with the, with the middleware. Not everybody here knows uh, Koa middleware, so I will show it. This is a code of a, let's say, very simple, but kind of typical Koa middleware. Uh, what is important? Uh, is that it's, it's, you see async await? How does it work? That's a great thing. So I assume most of you know how middleware works, right? You just go down, at one point it turns uh, the flow to the back and you go back. 
uh, with uh, async, uh, you run things that are about the next function, then you pause the execution, you pass the execution to the next middleware, and when this middleware eventually asynchronously returns, you continue. So uh, a prime example, I'll show you a little bit later. And then uh, you just <laughs> put all of these middlewares to the core. This is the difference. In Koa, you run all the middlewares. There's one entry point, it's one middleware, no roads, and I think every middleware is run, which sounds counterintuitive, oh, sorry, counterintuitive, but it's actually pretty fast because you don't have to make these decisions. You just always run the same thing. The middleware has uh, two arguments. The first one is called context, and it's commonly written as CTX. Uh, this is the only way how you communicate with the outer world. This is where you have uh, response, context dot uh, response, context dot request, uh, which are some wrappers around the native objects. And you can also pass, let's say, some status or like whatever information. But in the end, only things that you add to the context or you run on the context will matter. That means, for us, testing this middleware means observing changes on this uh, object. The second uh, argument is uh, next middleware. You have to, you either don't run it at all, and in this case, it's the last middleware and you will return the execution back, or you have to evade it. Uh, that's a, it's a common mistake and it's kind of difficult to catch it if you forget to write the array. This is a GIF I took from the Koa website. It will show you how the middleware works and it goes. Just for we understand that, here we have three middlewares. Uh, with one starting on line six, then on line 15 and line 24. Uh, I now will run uh, the, the animation and you will see in which order things are executed. I start with the first middleware. Uh, I go to the next, pause it. Uh, I go to the next middleware, it goes there. In the last one, it returns, and it executes these things in like reverse order. I will load it one, one more. I hope you will understand that. For a unit test, we want to test this one piece of a middleware. That's it? Yeah, cool. This is a simple test of such task. It's a little bit naive in certain ways. Uh, but as I said, what we do is we create an object. It's a, some mock, right, called context. We run our uh, middleware, and then we run some uh, assertions on the context. Again, it's kind of simple, right? Everything happens, we know what's happening. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, just supports, AC, oh, sorry, yeah, uh, supports async and await by default. So, just itself will wait for all the execution to happen. If there were maybe some file reads or whatever, just will wait for that. It's out of the box there. Uh, the context is the object we mock, uh, and that's the one we will be observing. And this part there, that's the next callback. It has to be there. It has to be something. This is the most minimal approach you can have. It's just a no walk. And then, as I said, uh, this is the mock, and just test what is there, the normal expect syntax. What you might notice here is that here we received the string, which was done in this simple middleware, like at the end, right? And it's, for us in this case, it's difficult to say what happened before calling evade next, which is the first part of the middleware, and what happened after that. If we just assign this uh, string in the in the path after next, uh, we wouldn't know uh, if it's maybe maybe it's a, maybe it's a mistake, right? Let me get this straight. For most middlewares, this might be okay. You kind of only care about what happened like after the whole middleware is run, right? But at certain points, you might want to pass something for the next middlewares, and in that case, you need to know what happened before and what happened after wait next. For that, we will kind of use small. The trick is a good place. Okay, this is the change middleware. I call it before and after test. Uh, in the end, it has two parts. The first part 
is that now next is not a simple no op, but it's a function uh, which is executed, right? Just exactly the same in the place where the abate happens, right? This is exactly executed here. It just will run this assertion. So this is the before part. You can pass that the body was changed and whatever. You can even mock uh, that the, on this line, you can even mock uh, the other middleware. Maybe they appended something to the body, right? And then, kind of as before, you uh, run the assertions for the after, after test. Uh, where could this be important? As I said, maybe you are reading a file, maybe you are doing some logging, uh, maybe you are generating ETEC. You want to make sure that these things happen in the, exactly the place it should have. Okay, that's one, one bit thing which is kind of confusing. That's this part, right? I, instead of just making next a normal function, I wrap it into just a pen, which is kind of a spy. It's a function that I can make assertion on. And I can assert that this function has been called. Why do I do that? As I said, technically you don't have to run next in the, in the middleware. And if you didn't run the text next, it wouldn't run the tests, which I have, which happen here. And you would have no idea that this thing happened, right? And if you remove the next, maybe you misspelled whatever, I don't know, maybe you remove the line at all. It's still a valid middleware. It still could maybe uh, return the right content, maybe, I don't know, uh, but you wouldn't test it right. So this part is important to make sure that the next has been called. Uh, we can do a little bit better because there are still some problems with this. This is what I call a complete test. It's a little bit more complicated and you will only need it in a certain occasions and for certain sort of middleware. But let's say in this place you, you test most of the things. So what changed? I have to link here. I'm sorry, yeah. Oh yeah, so what, what has changed? So uh, first I'm using uh, snapshot testing. That's one thing that just brought in, whew, maybe you say here now. Uh, snapshot testing means that you have an object and what do you do, take, it, take a picture, serialize it, save it into some file. And when you run the test again, it kind of compares these serializations if they are the same. Why is it great? So I will show you how this thing would work. So I'm taking picture snapshot of the context Jest will automatically, and I mean the utilities are correct, really nice. You don't have to do anything. It will generate this file. It will also make sure that when you change something, it shows really nice uh, errors will change, and and you have to either approve the change or say, oh no, I have to change something, and you don't approve the change. So here you see it uh, serializes the object. It writes a few information, like set as a function, right? Not much more information. Uh, so this is how a snapshot would look like. And you can see we do two snapshots, so you would have uh, like one and two in that. Uh, oh, sorry, I was, no. Why is this useful? Is that this takes a picture of the whole object. So even if you add something, this test would catch it. Again, maybe it's something you don't care about. You only care what is well, how the body has changed. But maybe if you add a header in this middleware, right? If you were only testing what is inside body, you wouldn't see that a uh, header has changed. So that's why this thing is kind of useful. Uh, another thing I do here is that I'm mocking uh, the COA utilities. So COA provides you with response object, which has a set method. In here, I kind of mock this function, and then I can assert that it was called. I do more than that. I again use snapshot testing. I sometimes guilty, uh, overused snapshot testing, and sometimes they use it. What is a good thing about the last line I have here uh, is that this doesn't only check that the function was called or that it was called with certain arguments. It checks more. It checks that how many times it was called and the order of the arguments, right? I will show you an example. 
This is the snapshot of that call. You see, the first array is uh, the calls. The second array are the arguments. So if you call the function twice, the first array will have uh, uh, two items, each item being all the arguments passed to the function. Here I see I call the function once, and with two arguments, e tag and some number. Again, this is useful because now I know in which order things happened, uh, how many arguments were passed. Maybe you are passing some extra argument which you wouldn't be checking otherwise. Uh, this is really a picture and it has to be the same. Yes, and then there's this part. That, that basically does almost the same thing as before. So before we had just away uh, greetings and the arguments. What I do now is that I'm using this thing called resolves. It's especially uh, added to the JS20 for the uh, promises and asynchronous functions. This makes, sure, this makes sure that the middleware runs and that uh, the promise is fulfilled and that the function does not return anything. I'm not sure I, noticed, I, I said that, but in Koa, Everything happens in context function. If you return anything, it's ignored. So it's probably a mistake when you return something. Uh, how resolves work? <laughs> resolves is a, I call it an unwrapper. Takes a promise, waits to its execution, checks if it was fulfilled, and gives you the, the, the value, uh, which is the result of the uh, promise. And you can then run any assertion, assertion here. This thing when I have to be undefined, which is Pretty simple one, but I can. I just received the value, which was the execute, uh, which was the return value of that async function, and I can do any other sessions. Again, it doesn't sound useful, but it actually is. It's a small addition, and it, ta it takes care of many things which you might forget about. As I know, as I said before, uh, there's re resolves and rejects, and rejects is even more important. When you expect something to reject. Uh, it's more than just saying it will fulfill because if it accidentally will not reject, for JS there is no error, right? Something happened, it passed, why would I be worried? This function makes sure that it's cached. What is also, there's the more errors. Uh, I think it's still readable, it was readable, and if you run assertions on the resulting value, it's nice. But what is really useful as a, as a developer experience is errors. The first line is when you are reading a file and you receive an error, what just tells you is just read error. You have nothing, you don't know what happened. In the second line, using the results, it will tell you what happened, why is the problem, and maybe it's easier for you to find it. Right, so we, we tested the middleware, right? So we need to test something more. So this is the picture I, I really like. It's from uh, Ken Dodds. And he says, unit testers be like, look like it's working, right? We have unit tests, every part of the body is working, the head is reading, but it doesn't work together, right? What we need to do is we need to test the whole application together. Uh, I call it API, I will tell you why. I think it's a normal name, but uh, it's important to distinguish two things. It's the application as the HTTP server, where we are testing the responses, we are sending a GET request or whatever, and we receive some, uh, some response back. Because the core application is also defined by the middleware we uh, pass to it, it can be tempting to just take all the middleware, we have access to it, uh, compose it using core compose, and it gives you one middleware which does everything, right? I mean, yeah, you can test this, but I kind of feel that's useless. And I would say uh, it doesn't give you much more confidence and all the tests will be so long, you will have to uh, mock so many things and in the end, I don't think it's worth it. It's, oh yeah, and, and as I said, Koa provides you with a lot of functions and if you call them, you would have to mock them and mocks are nice, but if you don't overuse them. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to run these HTTP assertions. Uh, also called API testing. Unfortunately, it just will not be able to do this itself. It doesn't have our capabilities. 
it uses, I mean, I will be showing how to use a super test. I assume that maybe some of you know super test. Well, that's you people, cool. It's a, it's a run and thin wrapper over a uh, super agent. Uh, it's a TJ's, frame, uh, TJ's libraries. Uh, what is nice about it is that it's fast and it supports promises out of the box. So we can keep the nice uh, API. Uh, Valentino, I'm sorry, uh, Cagliardi, I guess, has written a really nice article and he wrote it like two weeks ago. It's a really nice one. It goes into uh, exactly what I will be talking about and I actually borrowed the sample project from here. Uh, he goes a little bit slower from the setup of the project and how to install dependencies and things like that. I assume you know that. I also changed the tests he wrote a bit with some features of Jest I think that are not as known as I think they should be. Uh, so I'm building on his work, it's a great one, but I also hope I will add something more. This is the uh, this is the application actually, it's a core application that he writes, I changed some names. Uh, it's kind of simple one, you see we use a core router and the only thing we do is on the root uh, road, uh, we pass you a JSON which has uh, a structure, we have a data and we have a person and that thing has four fields. That's a simple one, sample one. I will show it to you so remember this again, data, person, name, last name, role, and age. Right, so how do we test this? Oh, no, 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 sorry, one more thing. Here, and that's important, I export the application. I don't export the server. I export core app. Why is that important? It makes easy, uh, testing much more easier. So if I would, Oh, sorry, this should be listen, my bad. This should be app listen, which starts a server. Okay, my bad. So if I would run the listen part, Koa would already uh, create a server on some port. And the problem is, and that's the, like, one of the biggest mistakes people do with uh, API testing, they don't close the server after the test, and the server is still running. And then the next test requires a new instance of Koa, and then again, they don't close these, and you have memory leaks, and that can be problematic. So you have to think about that. On the other hand, from the app, you can receive an app callback, which is exactly the thing you would pass to HTTP server. If you do that, SuperTest will take care of everything. It knows the function. It will open a server on some random port, test things when you close. Uh, it closes the port, closes the server. You don't have to think about, you don't have to remember that. So this is a boardroom play test. It's like very simple test of that. Uh, let me quickly go through that. Uh, the most important part is this part. Well, not important. Well, I mean, it's so short that everything is important, right? This is the part where you kind of say what do you want to call. Again, the request is uh, then people usually give to super test, uh, app is the server, and here I say I want to get what is on the path slash. You can pass other things, you can uh, change headers, you can, I don't know, pass data when it's a post, for example, or whatever. You just prepare the request, and then you await it. Uh, and you save this response as a response. And then, which is uh, on this line, we do some assertion, that's what I will be talking next, right? I mean, this part will be the same, and here we will be probably start running something more sophisticated than just it's defined. Okay, so as I said, we will be replacing the, the this line, just so it's clear. This is the test that, that uh, uh, Valentino wrote, and it's, it's a very good one, I would say. So what we do is that, we look at the response at certain properties and we kind of make sure that it puts certain strings or numbers. With one exception, that's this last line, right? It's kind of like just to go for that so we know what's happening. We take keys of a response by a person and then we want to make sure it's equal to what? Array containing? What? 
right? That's confusing, right? What does it do? Like, will it fail if I add something? Will, like, I don't know. It's, I, I, can't, I, I find this a little bit uh, confusing. And again, if I were to change it, I think it can cause some confusion. So this thing does that it can, you can add more things to the person, but it has to have at least these uh, variables. Okay, uh, I want to show you something which uh, comes from X, uh, expect. Uh, it gives you more control about the shape of the object. I call it object equality testing. Uh, we, as I said, we describe the structure. You can think of like a, some type system, like a flow or type script or, or maybe uh, prop types. You just describe what you want. Uh, what I like about this is that I see it from the first glance, what should be what. I also use some other, some, uh, other testing. So for example, you can say expect anything, which just means it's there, it's not empty. Uh, yeah, you can have expect any string, any number, so you make sure it's something what you want. Or you have many others like uh, string matching, string containing, array containing, which we saw. And there's one a little bit special, which is called object containing. Uh, what is the difference between, let's say, what we see, okay, sorry, this is the same thing. So, what is the difference between wrapping an object in expect object containing like we see on the second line and not wrapping it in it like we see on the third line? You see person and object with no extra words. As you would expect, if it's without this expect object containing, the shape has to match exactly. When it's wrapping that, it has to be a subset of the resulting object. That's exactly what you want here, maybe. So here the person has to have exactly this uh, shape, and then we have the data there in the body. We don't care about it in this test. It's being ignored. Yeah, this is, it's not nice to write this, right? But technically, you can describe it, you can write TDD. Well, yeah, write like actually write, write. Uh, but yeah, I, I find it still too verbose. So maybe I can, I mean, probably like the people who were, some of them know what I want to say right now, right? Yeah, exactly, I hear that. We can do snapshots. So um, when we do snapshot, the whole thing just goes into one line, which is on the top, that's why I showed it there. And it says, I want the response body to make snapshot. And again, I take the snapshot of the body. This is how it would look like. Uh, I have all the information. I have some uh, yeah, encoding problems. <laughs> Hopefully it will work. <laughs> Uh, snapshot testing is nice, but again, it takes really like the object needs to match exactly. For you, it's less work because you just say, I approve the next change. Uh, how does that differ with TDD? Because TDD and snapshots are directly like antithesis of each other. With TDD, you will probably want to when you want to use it for algorithms, you know, some work like some computations. This is the exact input, this is the output. I don't know, you do some complex thinking, uh, and the result is kind of, let's say, easy, maybe a number, maybe a few numbers. Uh, on the other hand, snapshots were created maybe for React components. I mean, can you imagine writing TDD for React components? You basically, like, you would have to write the whole HTML structure and then you would rewrite it in the, in the React, maybe with some, I don't know, uh, like a template string, right? So I think it would be too much work. For complex structures, and by that I mean really big JSONs uh, or HTML fragments, snapshot testing can be easier. TDD is write test before that. Uh, with snapshots, you don't want to do that. As I said, it's for big structures, you don't want to write it before. So it's usually very really good when you add things. So imagine, you are building this JSON, right? So the, in the first line, we have the watch, uh, the test watch, so you always see immediately feedback what has changed. You add name, the test will fail and say, oh, there's a new field, do you approve that? And you say, yes, I approve that. You add uh, age, and the test says, oh, you removed uh, name and age, and you edit age, is it good? Is it, oh, I forgot to add it, I forgot, like, I, I removed the name. So you add name and age, and it says, oh, there's new age, and you approve it. So that's, I guess, concurrent. You do it as you develop any kind of approved, immediate, small changes. 
The other thing, and I saw that I actually used that, is that when you have a large code base which is not tested, and writing TDD style tests can be pretty annoying. You kind of maybe are <coughs> looking for a refactoring. And for that, you need to conserve the current state. You need to be sure that the new refactored thing does within the same uh, results. For that, you do snapshots, you refactor, you make sure that the uh, results are the same. DDD is good for testing one part. H is for the two. Snapshots are good for the whole structure. That's the difference. What I said today doesn't apply to Quant. Uh, to be honest, the second part about the API testing, that applies to anything, any uh, Node.js server, right? I mean, without change, basically. If you can provide a callback or the server and you make sure you close the test, it's the same test, which again, is great for uh, refactoring. Maybe you are switching from Express to Koa, the good way, or maybe from, I don't know, whatever. Like you, you, you everybody has some opinions about their frameworks and when you will finally meet the company that will allow you to rewrite everything, you can do the snapshot, uh, snapshots, right? Uh, what I showed about the first part, API middleware, sorry, about the middleware, uh, I would like you to like see these patterns. And when you are testing asynchronous function, you might think that it's not as easy as it always looks like. There are these pitfalls. I have a list of uh, resources you might want to read. Uh, some I will I will post it somewhere. Uh, I will point you to this one, which is my presentation uh, exactly about pitfalls in uh, async testing. And those great two articles by Valentino, where he goes really, you don't have the link, but you can uh, with the camera. I would wait for the last slide, because this is not just a presentation. Actually, it is a presentation. But as I was preparing it, I coincidentally wrote an article. <laughs> I, I was running, I guess I was uh, creating the presentation. It's a sneak peek. I haven't released the presentation. This is the medium a link for the, what is that, for reviewers, right? So I would like you all to review my article, maybe write comments on the parts which are not <laughs> that uh, easy to follow for you. I will try to respond to that. And I have half build repo with all these things. So I have the repo for the second part for the API testing. I will promise that I will eventually add the first part, and you can look at that and, and comment on that uh, as well. I will add the link for the repo into the article, bit.ly slash chest minus core. Thank you very much. <laughs> I would say we still have a few minutes for questions. If there are, we have a question. Uh, for snapshots, uh, can you put any variables or any unknowns? The question is if uh, for snapshots we can pass any variables. Unfortunately, no. Uh, you can, however, it just takes a snapshot of an object, right? And you can do whatever you want with the object. So what I often do is that I receive a response, I remove the timestamp because I would fail the snapshot immediately, and I take snapshot of the new object. So you can I ignore like the number one? It's, it's not. It's, it's not ignoring, it's taking snapshot of an edited object, but you have to take care of it yourself. Uh, what I did in the, in the presentation is that I didn't take picture of the whole response, because that maybe would be too big, there would be too many things that have changed, and I only took snapshot of the response body, and then I can, on the second line, I can take picture of, uh, sorry, uh, snapshot of uh, response headers, for example, right? I have a question. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for the note. Uh, uh, first of all, small, small question about uh, snapshot. Like, if you have some error there, so your test is failed, do you see actually on which line it happened? On which line of snapshot it doesn't match? Yes, yes, uh, that's a good one. So, uh, it does serialize both uh, structures. It's, it's a string. I'm not sure if it was visible. I might, want, I might find that quickly. Uh, but the snapshot is a, it's a string. It starts here, and at here, it will compare these like a lexicographically, lexicographically, no, like a text strings, and it will show you, oh, 
here is different than here. And it, it's like a div, like a normal div, just a string div like a, like a kid would do. So you would see, oh, this thing uh, is added, and this thing is removed from the what I have. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I see here we have some values as, as, as uh, so you can pass any any objects, any uh, variables there, but you still can use some some specific values. You can pass some specific values. Uh, I'm not sure if you want like 42. Is yes, yes, valid. yes. If you want the age to be, I mean, it takes the, of the picture of the object and everything it has. It doesn't think we should prototype as you see. So if these things would be accessible in prototype, you wouldn't see it. It's a, let's say, somehow two chase and whatever you would call that. What you can do, I forgot to mention it, is you can you can extend these uh, serializations. So you can add your own serializations. Serialize a function, thank you. Uh, and you can say, if this object has in prototype something like super test, remove timestamp, remove URL, remove that thing, and change that thing, and take a picture of that. Uh, this, for example, was used for immutable JS uh, uh, library. Do you know immutable JS? So immutable JS has a special kind of built in uh, snapshot serializer. So you have, for example, immutable.map, and then you have kind of nicely shown. It works the same for React. So for React, you don't see objects, you see kind of JS, let's say, let's say, let's say JSX. But you can write your own. And you can register them globally. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask, there's the, the folder, the path over there, includes the underscore, underscore, snapshot, smooth underscore. Is this where the JS automatically produces these? But there is this that I just come, oh, sorry, the question is about the snapshots uh, folder and its name. Uh, just uh, comes with certain defaults. And the default is that it runs on the files that have .spec.js or .test.js or are in underscore underscore test underscore underscore folder. As I said, you don't have to do anything else, just have these files, it will search for them, it will run them. If any of them have snapshot testing, it will create a folder called underscore underscore snapshots underscore underscore in the same directory as a test and it will add all these snapshots in it. These things can be configured, but uh, this is like the default that uh, just has. So the first time you run the test, it will create this file. And yes, and as I said, the good thing, I mean, you can say run test and update all the snapshots, kind of like, I believe what I wrote is right. <laughs> you don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is that just a really nice watch mode. And it can, it's really good because, for example, it runs the test of, failed first, because they are most likely to fail, right? You, you, are, you work on that. And it also shows you the changes in the snapshots, and you can like say press U, like update, and it will say, okay, this is the new version, and it's running again. Um, yeah. More question? Yeah, yeah sure, go ahead. Uh, this slide exports root rule in the object equity, looks like some black music. Uh, sorry, once again? The test main class is number. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So this this fake root rule with object equality that comes from uh, 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 it's, it's the best name. Exactly what I said. Like here, I, I I only have root rule, but for that one, I have a different name. So it, what it does, it just concats all the describe, describe, test together, and adds the number, and the number is the uh, order of the. Uh, make snapshot in the file. It's, it's not magic. It's kind of it's kind of easy to follow. Okay. Uh, and, oh, that's a question. Yes. Yes. So, uh, yeah, so the question is about the just running a test in parallel. So, by default, just will look at number of your cores and somehow decide this magic number of uh, threads it will run the test, uh, which very often happens to be four. And uh, yeah, then it runs like the test. And it assumes that these, at least the test files, are independent. And it doesn't. Uh, 
It doesn't like the order can be changed, and it does change, as I said, the order. The failing test will be run uh, first uh, in the next run, so it doesn't maintain anything in between. Uh, but inside the test, you can have uh, like before each and uh, before all and after all and after each, and these are running the file, and you can do kind of whatever you want in this file. The individual tests are always run uh, top to bottom. That's a good question. I think I did use that actually. You can use uh, tensors only uh, because I think that you can't. Okay, so this okay. So kind of only ignores the rest, you say. <coughs> okay. But it still runs them. Yes, so we have ten files, yeah. it has a lot only. Yeah. It runs nine files completely, mm -hmm. and ten files it just has one. Okay. So that is not so what Ava has is a way back to the three files. Yeah. You open all ten files, scan for the only and don't skip, and then the file on the right file. It just does not have that. Uh, again, I'm sure it makes sense again because just has a watch mode and the way I guess and just the file. So, so if it's a nice way to just the same, just want to work on this one file and the watch mode, then do it on the test and every time you save it, it's just the file. Uh, this, uh, focus on the <coughs> file with all the salt batch. That is true, and just now only by default when you run the watch mode, it only watches the files that affect the files. No, no, that if you change something from the last commit, it will only run the test that they might have been affected via all the requires and everything. Thank you.